Um, I want to take this time to welcome all of you here and those of you that are watching online. You are in a place where the grace of God is shared by loving people because God accepts us just as we are and He sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. God's Word changes our lives as we read it. And so today we are going to be in the book of Ruth, chapter 1. If you want to make your way there, the title of today's message is God Heals the Broken Heart. Uh, We are in this series called Change of Heart, and uh, we've defined the heart as the innermost person. It's the the thing that makes you who you are. Uh, So with that in in mind, the idea then is if, if we are in ourselves, there's something that's against God, we need to have a change of heart. We need to have ourselves be made right with God. And so God does that. His Spirit uh, comes into our hearts, into our lives, and He transforms us because of the work of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, old things pass away, all things become new. You are a new creation in Christ. And now, now you've got some, uh, some really cool things that you're able to accomplish for the Lord. Now, once that happens, once you've had that change of heart, it's important to guard your heart. We talked about that. The way you guard your heart is by making sure that nothing comes in through your eyes into your heart or in through your ears into your heart. So you make a covenant with your eyes not to look at things you're not supposed to. You make a covenant with your ears not to listen to things you're not supposed to. And then you make a covenant with your feet not to walk yourself into places you shouldn't be. Does that make sense? All right, so that's the Change of Heart series that we're in. Now, last week, what we talked about is the fact that, that what is stored up in our heart is going to come out of our mouth naturally. So if we have good stuff stored up in our heart, good things are going to come out. Uh, if we have evil things, evil is going to come out. So if you missed last week, you can go to venia.tv forward slash sermons and catch up. But today, what I want to talk to you about is the fact that God will heal a broken heart. Uh, in Psalm 34, 18, it says this, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. How many of you have had a crushed spirit in your life? A broken heart. Okay, most people know what that feels like, to have a broken heart, to just have your spirit crushed. And it's not a good feeling. Nobody likes that. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, Today I'm going to have a broken heart. It's going to be awesome. Right? I mean, nobody thinks like that. That would be a weird thing. We, we all want to have a sound heart. We want to have a, a healed heart. We want to have a good heart. Nobody wants their heart to be broken. But we live in the real world, and every once in a while we have our heart broken. And what God says in His Word, and we know that when He says it, we can believe it, He says that He'll be close to those who have a broken heart. He says that He'll rescue those whose spirits are crushed. Now, it doesn't seem so in the middle of it, does it? I mean, when you're in the middle of a broken heart, you're just having, having one of the worst times of your life, the, the, and somebody came up to you and says, don't worry, you're, you're having a broken heart, don't worry. God is close to you. God will rescue you. In the middle of that, you don't really want to hear that, do you? I mean, you're, you're feeling terrible, and it just seems like there's no way out when you're in the midst of it. But what I want to tell you today is, It is true what God says. He will be close to you when you have a broken heart, and He will rescue you as your spirit is crushed. And not only that, but God can use that broken heart to guide your life. Maybe maybe you had gotten your heart broken by some guy at one time in your life, or, or you got your heart broken by some girl, and later on you come to meet your spouse, and you're like, thank God my heart was broken by that person because I wouldn't have this one, right? I mean, God will guide us in those times of broken hearts. So that's what we're going to talk about today as we get into the book of Ruth. So if you guys want to get their um, book of Ruth, chapter one, we're going to pick up in verse one. So this is the story of Ruth, um, Naomi, and Boaz. Those are the three main characters in this book of the Bible. Uh, Verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went uh, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the son was, I'm sorry, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, um, Ephrathites and uh, Bethlehem, Judah. 
and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. All right, so what's going on here? You've got this man who has a wife. He's got two sons. Uh, Where they're living there in Bethlehem, there's a famine in the land, and so they don't have food to feed their family. So they say, okay, what do we do about this? Well, we heard that there's food out there in Moab, so why don't we go ahead and get our family all hitched up, let's go and head on out, and we'll go and find some food so that way our family can survive. So they have plans, they have hopes, they have dreams for a better life. They have, they have this hope that, that they're going to find this place where they're going to be able to feed their family and thrive as a family. So they head on out, they're, they're on their way out there, and notice what happens in verse 3. It says, then Elimelech, Noah's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So right away, almost immediately in this story, what we see is a woman with a broken heart. Her husband has passed. She's now left with two sons. And in this time, uh, the biblical times, it was very difficult for a woman to be a widow. Uh, It it was very, very difficult times. So um, here they are. They're in this land that they're, they're not familiar with. They don't know a lot of people. The husband dies, the one who's supposed to be the breadwinner, and she's left with the two sons. This is a sad thing. Now, I know what this is like, if, in case you're wondering. I know what this is like. When I was young, my mom and my dad, you know, they had three, th- three, uh, three boys together, me and then my brother Nolan and his twin brother Nathan. And my father died and left my mom with three boys. And it was tough. My mom had a broken heart. I know what this looks like. You know, when we read through this, you know, sometimes there's certain stories that that you can read and you're like, yeah, I get this. This makes sense. You know, as I'm reading it, I can relate to this. I don't know if any of you can relate to to that type of loss, that type of broken heart, Um, but there's all sorts of things that break our heart that that we, we can relate to. And you can find many of those stories in the Bible, but this one for me, it really hit home. Here's this woman her husband dies. She's in a strange place. She's left with two sons. And then in verse 4, it tells us that they took wives of the women of Moab. So her two sons grow up. They get married. Uh, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. Now we're introduced to the main character of this story. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Okay, so 10 years goes by. You've heard time heals all wounds, right? Um, that, that's, that's kind of a, a misnomer, but, um, because I'll, I can tell you this, I know, I know my mother, uh, very well. And as much time has gone by, she still thinks about my dad. Now she got remarried to a wonderful man, uh, a blessing to me, raised me up in, as a, you know, in a Christian home. So I, I'm blessed to know that, that my mom had that, but I do know this, that September 5th of every year, I know what my mom's thinking about, because September 5th was the day that my dad died. My mom's heart was broken. And so she'll never, she'll never forget that. There will always be that in her heart. Um, so, so time goes by. But, but one thing that's true is as time goes by and you have God's spirit with you, or, or you have God's presence in your life, God, God can heal you enough to move on with life. Like I said, my mom got remarried, and um, she had five more kids. Uh, so, um, you know, and she has so much love to give. And so over time, you can see that, that God can direct you and add to your life, um, but it's never going to fully make up for, for a loss like that. So time goes by 10 years Boys are married now, and and take a look at what happens in uh, verse 5. It says that both Malon and Kilian also died. So the women survived her two two sons and her husband. So not only does this woman, you know, they head out because there's a famine. They they get to this land thinking, okay, we're going to do well. But then the husband dies, and 10 years later, both of her sons die. Now, I can tell you, again, I know what this is like because after my dad died, one of my brothers died. He died of cancer. And so I, I read this story, and I'm like, man, my mom can really relate to Naomi. 
to, to lose your husband and then lose, at least she didn't lose all her boys. Um, two of us survived, um, but she lost my brother Nathan. It's a hard thing. It's a devastating thing to have that kind of loss in your life. A broken heart is a very serious thing. And what we do with our broken heart is so important because if we, if we don't give it to God, we don't allow God to, to do a work in us, and we don't allow God to guide us in that, it can have really, really bad consequences. Yeah. Um, so here's Naomi. Husband died. Boys died. She's in a strange land. She's a widow. She's got two daughters-in-law. They're widows. Um, and so what, what does she do? So here she, it says in uh, verse 6 that she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard that in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So she hears that back home, basically. She's back home, God visited his people, he gave them bread, so hey, let's, let's go back home. <coughs> so therefore, she, in verse 7, she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So now she's, she's getting ready to go back. She's like, all right, there's nothing left for me here. I have no family. I have no way of supporting myself. I've got two daughters-in-law that I really, I really can't support them. And so the, the logical thing is head back home. There's food there now. There's family there. I can go there and they'll, they'll accept me in and they'll take care of me. And Naomi, verse 8, said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you, uh, grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my, my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She says, it grieves me. I've got a broken heart and you should just go return back to your families. I'm going to go back, return to my families. It grieves me. My heart's broken. And she's sending them on their way. Go back. Go back home. Now, verse 14 says that they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah's like, okay, I'm going to give you a kiss. I'm going back home. But Ruth is like, no way. She's clinging to Naomi. She's like, I don't want to go. And Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more so also, um, if anything but death parts you and me. So here you see a dedication in Ruth. She, she loves her mother-in-law. She's dedicated. She says, your people will be my people. Your God, the true God, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that we worship, um, the true living God is going to be my God. So in the midst of this broken heart, God is bringing a joy to Naomi because now there's, there's a fellowship, there's a devotion, there's a family element here. And so now you've got this, this woman who's willing to go with her to her relative's house and to, to live in a land that she's not aware of. She's a widow. She's a widow also. You know, it's hard to be a widow in that, that day and age. So she's a widow. She's going to go with her mother-in-law, who's a widow, to a strange land and worship the one true God. Now, verse 18 says, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. So in other words, okay, Ruth, you, you're, you obviously made your mind up. I'm going to stop trying to convince you not to go. And they start to head off. 
So verse 19 says that the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them, and the woman said, is this Naomi? I mean, it's been over a decade now, you know, and so here comes their family member, is this Naomi? But she said, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Mara means bitter. She says, don't, don't call me Naomi anymore. Uh, one thing about biblical times, when somebody had a name, uh, that name meant something about who they are. It meant something about their character. And so for her, her name was now Mara. She says, I'm bitter. I'm brokenhearted. Uh, I, I don't know why this has happened to me, but all I know is I'm bitter now. I, my heart is truly, truly broken, and I don't know what to do. I went out full, she says, verse 21, when she took off with her husband. She went out full. She had a full family. She had a husband. She had two sons. She had hope. She had plans. She had um, the, the hope of a better life. She went out full. And the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem and at the, beginning of the, um, at the beginning of the barley harvest. So they've returned now to the land of her, her family. They're there right at the beginning of the barley harvest. And something really special happens over the next three chapters. If you've read the book of Ruth, you know that when they get there, it's barley harvest time. So Ruth goes out into this field that's owned by a man named Boaz. And as she's there, Boaz finds out that Ruth is dedicated to Naomi. He sees her dedication. He sees how how loyal she has been to Naomi. And so he starts making special provisions for her. He says, hey, you know what? Just let some of the grains fall. We've talked about this before, that, that if you go and take grain from a field, you're not stealing. Like if you're poor, you're not stealing uh, what they would do is the, the workers would go through the field and whatever was not picked because they wouldn't get everything the first time through or, or some would fall on the ground. So they would just go through and there was a, a law in the Bible that, that if that happened, whatever fell on the ground would have to be left there or whatever was left over on the plant. So that way the poor could go and get their food. So there was, there was actually a, a way in the Bible for poor people to get food. They had to work for it. But there was a way for them to get it. And so Boaz, he sees her devotion. He sees her willingness to work. So he tells the people uh, that are working his fields, he says, listen, let some of the sheaves of grain, let them fall on the ground purposefully. Make it easy for her. Let her pick them up. Don't give her a hard time. Treat her properly. And this, this goes on over the next couple of chapters where, where she goes back to Naomi, and Naomi's like, oh my gosh, where did you get all this? And she, oh, I got it from the, this field. This man named Boaz owns it. And she's like, that's our, that's our family's kinsman redeemer. See, a kinsman redeemer it was something where if, if a man died and he wasn't able to have a son to carry on the family name, somebody else in that family would then have to marry the widow and provide a child, and that child would then carry on the name of that man who had died. So Boaz was the kinsman redeemer for the family, and it just so happened that was the field she ended up in. Just so happened, right? I mean, God is guiding the whole time in the midst of this broken heart, in the midst of the brokenness. God is always moving things along. So she shows up at this field, and, and this guy is Boaz. He's a kinsman redeemer. Uh, long story short, he ends up marrying this young woman, Ruth. And he ends up having a child through Ruth. Now, why is that important for us today as, as we consider this broken heart? The reason it's important is who ended up being born through Ruth? Matthew chapter 1. If you've read Matthew chapter 1, some people think it's real boring because it's just this person had this person, this person had that person. You know, it's this genealogy, and sometimes genealogies can be kind of boring. You know, this, this guy with this woman had this child, and then that guy with that woman had that child. But there's nothing, I can tell you this, there's nothing boring in God's Word. It's just, it's just we haven't realized how 
great it is sometimes. Uh, when we go through this, it's really cool because here in, in uh, verse 5, it says that Salmon begat Boaz, the man that we were just talking about. And Boaz, by, uh, well, so uh, Salmon and Rahab, by the way, Rahab was the prostitute in Joshua, right? So that's a weird thing that's, that's even in that scripture there. But so Salmon uh, begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by who? Ruth. And then Ruth, I'm sorry, then Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David, the king of Israel. And so now all of a sudden, this broken heart was used by God. It guided them back. It brought a woman who never would have been in Bethlehem. It brought her to Bethlehem. It brought this woman there to be the, you know, find the kinsman redeemer and now give birth to a son who would then have a son that would be the king of Israel. And what's more, if you keep going down that that lineage, in verse 16, it says that Jacob, so all the way through, from from Boaz going all the way down, came a man named Jacob who begot Joseph, the husband of who? Mary, of whom was born who? Jesus, who is called the Christ. I mean, in the midst of this brokenness, something amazing happened. Something beautiful happened. God was working things along the entire time. I know that's, that's hard for us because, like I said, when we're in the midst of the broken heart, we don't want to hear that God may be doing something. We don't, want, we don't like the idea that, that somehow our hurt is going to end up doing something good, do we? I mean, that, that's human nature. Typically, when we have the broken heart, all we want to do is get past it. We want to get healed. We don't like the broken heart. We don't like the uncomfortableness. And so we want to get past it. But in the midst of it, if we pause for a moment and say, all right, Lord, what are you doing? Why are you allowing it? Where do you want me to go? What relationship do you want me to fix? What changes in my life do I need to make? What is it that you're trying to show me in this broken heart? I can tell you, nothing is wasted by God. Nothing. In the midst of your broken heart, God's not like, oh, well, they got a broken heart. Oh, well. I mean, that's not how God works. Sometimes we think, well, there's so many people in this world, and my heart's broken, but God must not care about me. I mean, think about Naomi. Think about Ruth. There they are. They could have easily thought. We know Naomi definitely thought that. I'm I'm broken. I'm bitter. I went out full, and I've come back empty, and I don't know why God allowed this. But imagine telling Naomi, guess why? Here's what's going to happen. And, and explain to her the whole way through the, the amazing privilege they had as a family. Because every woman knew that, that, that the Messiah was going to come. Every, every woman was excited at the prospect that maybe, just maybe, their child would be the Messiah. They, they were excited about that. And so here's this woman who, in the midst of her broken heart, God guides this family along, and now you can see that God did something amazing in the midst of that. And we say that God rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Do you believe that this morning? You know, you've got to believe it. I'll tell you why. Because most of us admitted that at one point or another, we've had a broken heart. But we've gotten past that, most of us. Some of us are still in the midst of that. I want to tell you, God will draw close to you in the midst of your broken heart. God will do something in your life. Sometimes we just need to pray and say, Lord, what is it? What is it you want me to know right now? Jesus Christ himself, when he walked this earth, his heart was broken. He literally sat on the Mount of Olives and looked out at Jerusalem, and he wept over Jerusalem. His heart was broken. He saw Lazarus in a tomb and saw Lazarus' sisters crying and just the hurt that they were feeling. And what did Jesus do? He wept. 
His heart was broken. We don't serve a God who doesn't know what it's like to have a broken heart. We, know, we serve a God who knows exactly how we feel. He hung on that cross and literally had a broken heart for you and for me. And guess what? In the midst of that broken heart, God did something so special for us. He offered us forgiveness of sin. He offered us eternity with Him. God can do something amazing in the midst of your broken heart.